Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll profile uh, early North Dakota Governor Honest John Burke. But first, joining me now on the set is Republican State Representative Kathy Hawkins. Kathy, thanks so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure. As we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, your background, where you're originally from. I am a native uh, Fargonian. Um, been here all 66 years except for a few in college and uh, while my husband was in the Navy. Uh, we have two, I've been married for 43 years to the same guy, he's pretty darn special. And we have two grown children, uh, both married then, and four grandchildren. And that's awesome. Um, right now I don't have another job other than the legislature. I tell a story that, you know, how do you say to a boss, well I need three and a half months off, plus then I need a couple days off a month in the interim, but when I'm here, I'd be really good. <laughs> uh, so fortunate, I had, I had wonderful bosses at, when I first started running and they allowed me the opportunity to go to Bismarck. Well with that said, how did you get involved in politics? I actually have been involved in politics since I was a very young lady. My mom was an advocate of doing volunteer work and helping for the causes you believed in. And I was a um, Nixon Dolly and a Goldwater girl uh, and stuffed a lot of envelopes. And, and I was a political science major for a while. I really wanted to be Nancy Dickerson, but you know, you say that now and people look at you with this blank stare like, okay, and who is she? Uh, so I've moved it up to Barbara Walters. Uh, <laughs> women weren't hired at the time I was in college. So I ended up in education and uh, I still have that uh, major in political science. Okay. Well, all right, let's talk a little bit about uh, what's been going on since the legis legislative session ended. And I mean, interim committees are still going on and uh, talk about what, what's going on and which ones you're working on. I serve on the budget section, was, which is all of the appropriations people from both the Senate and the House, as well as the leadership on both sides of the aisle. And we serve in the interim to look at uh, issues that deal with dollars. Uh, sometimes it, you worry about the fact that maybe you're overstepping your bounds during, during the interim, but um, hopefully we don't do that very often. Uh, I'm also on higher ed. I've been there for a number of years and continue to work um, to help support what I feel is one of the biggest economic engines we have in the state of North Dakota. We have a really good chairman this year, Dr. Mark Sanford, uh, who's better known for K-12. He is uh, one of the smartest financial minds in K-12 education, but he has the whole year slated out as to how the, uh, the things we've been assigned to look at will fit into the year. And so I'm uh, cautiously optimistic that we might do something positive. Okay. Well, let's talk about one of the big issues that played out uh, in the last uh, few months, and that was the um, firing, I guess, of the higher education Chancellor Shivani. What were your thoughts on this, and where did you stand? Well, you know, if, if, if people read the newspaper, they probably know pretty well where I stood on that issue. I was um, terribly upset with uh, the selection of Dr. Shivani. I, I still shake my head to think, how could this have happened? Uh, the search firm apparently told the board members that he was perfectly fine, that they'd done the vetting. Uh, I find that a little difficult when the college students knew before he ever set foot in North Dakota that he had had some, he'd had a troubled past. Um, his, uh, his method of dealing with, with people was not collaborative. Uh, and his actions proved over and over again that he was not the right man for the job. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you alluded to it, but uh, the checking of backgrounds in this day and age, how, how do you feel like were, were we just not, were, were, was the committee just not informed of his past? You know, I, I wasn't there. Yeah. I'm not on that committee, so it, it's hard to be judgmental, but um, you, uh, really all you had to know how to do was Google. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, the two um, sealed sexual harassment lawsuits, I think, are what bother me even more than the vote of no confidence from, from his faculty. Uh, that was an issue. And as a, as a female, um, I tasted that. Okay. What do you think of uh, uh, Dr. Shivani's uh, evaluations of UND President Kelly and NDSU President Brishani? Were they fair? You know, I... 
again, I you know that it wasn't my role to do that. I think there was a little bit of uh, I, there was a little vin, vindic, you know, he, he was being vindictive. Uh, I, I think. I mean, he came in, and whether he got that from other board members from this state, um, that he was supposed to come in and be the hatchet man, uh, and certainly that was one of the rumors going around the Capitol, or not, um, that's, to me, that isn't how you get anything positive done. Mm -hmm. How about the call uh, for all the emails relating to, related to this issue? You know, what, what's going on with that? And you know, I don't know, and I would love to know. Uh, I think that, you know, if they want to look at my emails, there certainly were, and actually I did find out they had looked at my emails. Uh, there were certainly comments in mine that said I didn't feel he was the right person for the job, and I probably didn't say it that nicely. Um, but I think it was a wild goose chase. If there was something that they were trying to prove, then put that out there. This is what we're looking for. Otherwise, it wasn't a secret that there were a large number of people who did not care for Dr. Shivani's style of leadership. That wasn't a secret. It was in the paper. If you talk to any of the student government leaders, I mean, it was, it was there. There was a problem. Uh, and so I, the amount of money the search for those emails has cost the state of North Dakota. Somebody said $40,000. That wouldn't touch it. It's well over, it's in the hundreds of thousands of, of people hours mm -hmm. that could be used doing something much more valuable than that. So to me that was, um, I, I think we need to look at that uh, rule that, that as legislators we can ask for anything we want and we don't have to pay for it. I think maybe there should be a limit. If it's more than a certain number of hours, then we have to pay for it, just like you would if you asked. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's too easy to just say, yes, I want to see everyone. Well, no, you really don't. And it takes a long time to go through and make sure everything's blanked out that, shouldn't, that, that is not your business. So um, I, I found that to be not a good practice. Okay. And I don't think it found anything. I mean, it, there was no smoking gun. I don't think Dr. Kelly and Dr. Bruschani are sending Dr. Shivani a Christmas card. I would say you're probably right there. Uh, how about the search for the new interim chancellor? Uh, understand, uh, as we record this, in fact, the decision may already been been made by the time this, this comes to, to broadcast. You're down to two candidates. Uh, can you talk about who they are and... and I certainly on? can. One is uh, Dr. Larry Scogan, and he is the current president of uh, Bismarck State. Uh, and uh, he has, he's sort of, they, they named him right away because he is familiar with all of the campuses. And, and uh, the, the one nice thing is our presidents all do work very well together. That was a, a, one of the side benefits of Dr. Shivani. They all bonded, and they work very well together. So he has been the person in place. Uh, I'm not sure if a decision has been made, if he is the one that's selected, whether he will need to resign from his position at BSC or not. That's something that the Board of Higher Ed will decide. The other candidate is Shane Gettle. He has been the uh, head of the Commerce Department. Uh, most recently, he uh, has um, served as a consultant uh, for a number of people during the legislative session and has worked with uh, an, an advertising on North Dakota Advertising Agency. So he is uh, both um, fine gentlemen, and uh, whoever is selected uh, will be in charge for the next at least 14 months. Uh, and then, if depending on what happens with the initiated measure on changing the the structure, until they find a permanent chancellor. With that said, leads right into my next question. What do you think uh, <clears throat> of the calls in some quarters to do away with? Uh, a higher education chancellor? Well, really they want to do away with the Board of Higher Education and replace it with a three-member commissioner. The Board of Higher Ed is appointed by, the, those members are appointed by the governor, approved by the Senate. The new form, if it was chosen, would be three commissioners appointed by the governor and responsible to the governor. So it would change a little bit where the reporting goes. There, There's a feeling in some quarters that the Board of Higher Ed isn't responsible to anybody. Um, if that's the biggest concern, then I think that's what we should be addressing. The Board of Higher Education is there for a reason, and that puts a little bit of a buffer in there. 
Uh, there are a number of people in the legislature who feel they have the answers to everything and would like to be in charge. We're not on all those committees, nor should we be, in my opinion. Um, I think the Board of Higher Education serves a very good purpose, and I, I truly hope that the citizens of North Dakota leave it in place. Okay. Why is there uh, such animosity between the legislature now and the higher education system? Can you put your finger on it? Uh, how, how far does it go back? Well, you know, I, it, I think it goes back a, a very long time. Uh, when each college campus came in and did their dog and pony show for the legislature, and um, they then the legislators got to decide who was going to get how much money. And if you had a president that was really charismatic, uh, Tom Clifford at UND comes to mind, you got a little more money. If you got one who wasn't quite so good at talking with people and, and had that, you know, Tom Clifford was just a phenomenal man. But, he, you know, not everybody can be him. Uh, then you didn't get quite as much money. And so there was animosity between the campuses on the fairness. And, and so when, when all of this started going through a system kind of situation, that changed. We tried the peer idea. That didn't work. Uh, the round table for some of us, which partnered business with the colleges. I thought that was a great thing and, and so did a lot of other people around the country. But some of our legislators didn't like that. It had taken a little bit of the authority of the legislature away. But because it gave the campuses flexibility with accountability. If they were going for a grant, they could do that without having to come back to the legislature and ask for that 10 cents to match it. Um, and so that piece was good. But you know, I, I, it's very bizarre. There are always personalities. We're so lucky in this state. We have, you know, probably too many colleges. But the people seem, every time they voted, they've said, no, we want them all. Um, I always laugh that you can walk to college in North Dakota. But they're good. And one thing the Board of Higher Education has done very well is hire wonderful presidents. I think we need to get out of the way and let them do their job. And that's uh, that becomes that becomes I think part of it. Who's in charge? Who get who gets to make those decisions? And I don't I, I, I don't know how we make that go away. But we need to work on it because what the, what the colleges and universities do for North Dakota is mind-boggling. The amount of dollars we never talk about the revenue side. We only talk about what we give them, which by the way is. Uh, well, the two universities get about 23% from the state of North Dakota. So there's an awful lot of brouhaha for that 23%. Uh, they do most of that on their own. 75% of the fundraising that they do, is, we have nothing to do with. We do take care of the buildings, sometimes not as well as I think we should. But, um, you know, there, there are lots of pieces to this puzzle. We all need to work together to make sure that it moves forward, not backwards. Okay. Well, let's turn and, and give you sort of an open-ended here. I know there's some things that you weren't happy about uh, uh, in the session that didn't get done, maybe. Can you talk about these? You know, there there always are things that don't get done. I, I went into the session very excited and very optimistic. We have, North Dakota has so, so many blessings. We have wonderful commodity prices right now. We have all that lovely oil and yet we also have, with that comes some responsibilities we had some opportunities i think to move the state even further ahead and um because we got bogged down in in some of the minutia i think we missed it mm -hmm. and that's um you know that's just that's just an opinion we did do a lot of good things in the end it was very hard getting there you know i still wonder why we don't want to invest a little more in our young people, and by that I mean, you know, very young people with early childhood education. We gave districts uh, the opportunity. We said, yes, you can do it, but we're not going to give you any money to do it. We still don't put any money into Head Start, and we have a, a waiting list a mile long. We are the only state in the country that does not help out with Head Start. And the answer always is, we can't subsidize that. Well, gee, we subsidize through Renaissance zones, we subsidize through uh, farm programs, we subsidize ethanol. 
I can't think of anything better to subsidize than those young minds. Hmm. So that that's always one of my bandwagons. Well, and uh, <coughs> anyway, uh, turn to oil country. Was enough done uh, there or too little, in your opinion? You know, I don't know that we can ever do enough. Hmm. The needs out there are absolutely huge. I think some good legislation was put in shape, in, in place to move in the right direction. Uh, we are behind, we were behind the eight ball. I don't think we started when we should have. We certainly didn't say, okay, we hope this is coming, let's put a plan in place. Uh, so we've got housing developments that roads don't match up and you know things of that nature because we weren't thinking far enough ahead. Uh, as legislators that went meeting every other year we have a tendency to think in two-year time blocks. Well life does not exist in two-year time blocks. So I think a good stab was made. Uh, is there enough? Probably not. One of the best programs, I think, is the housing program. The, uh, and this, this was visionary, where businesses can, can put in an incentive piece and then they build uh, low and moderate priced housing. A number of areas, U.S. Bank, I think, gave $3 million. Well, they get the tax credit, so it helps the business, but it also helps the community tremendously because those, those housing units will be built. And a number of those communities are, are building the houses for law enforcement, educators, uh, medical personnel because they can't afford to live there because mm -hmm. the prices have gone up so fast and the you know not every job is an oil job mm -hmm. so do we need to do more yeah we probably do Kathy I know sometimes uh, you've been critical of going zone even in your own party uh, issues like abortion and others do you feel like you're in the wrong party no I really don't um, as I said I, I've grown up stuffing envelopes and I have a great elephant collection. Uh, I believe the Republican Party stands for personal responsibility. Limited government. But that doesn't mean no government. It means limited government. And the party has moved from where I am. But I still live there. I'm hoping that they're going to come back to my neighborhood. Okay. Kathy, we are running out of time, but what do you like about being a state legislator? The opportunity to make a difference. North Dakota is so unique. Every individual has the opportunity to talk to their legislators, to talk to their governor. It is special. I want people to know who their legislators are. I want them to talk to them. And I want them to watch what we do. And then if we aren't doing what they think we should be doing, then we shouldn't go back. And that's how we'll make a change. I should ask you that as the last question, but what are some of the big issues going to be facing the legislature in 2015? Even though it's a year away, it'll be here before you know it. Uh, certainly how we handle the, the, the pieces in the oil field and the oil patch. Should we be paying for the education out there? Is that a local issue? Uh, our infrastructure itself, the number of bridges in the state of North Dakota that need to be fixed, that's a big number. Water always going to have issues on water and certainly that is very near and dear to uh, those of us who live in the valley. We want to keep it out and we want to bring it in. So those are those are issues that certainly will be on, on my plate as we go in and of course the kids. We got we to gotta figure out a way to do affordable quality child care. Okay. Well again, uh, Kathy, if people want more information about you or our state government, where's the best place for them to go? nd.gov is a great website. They are really trying to keep it up in today's world and we're not all that hard to find. And our phone numbers are all there. Give us a call. Yeah. Again, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Stay tuned for more. It's little known that the statue of Honest John Burke represents North Dakota in the United States Capitol. The statue stands as a testament to the early North Dakota governor whose hard work, intelligence, and dedication to duty represents a man who was instrumental in ridding the state of political corruption. John Burke shows that with a concerted effort, 
bossism can be put in its place. That if the people get cranky enough, that change can happen, which I think sometimes is quite comforting to know that change can happen or change will happen when good people get together. He arrives just before statehood. I think he arrives in 1888. And uh, he's elected to uh, the State House of Representatives, uh, spends a term there, and then uh, is elected to the State Senate. And he doesn't really shine. But if you look at his first, say, 10 years in public office, they're not symbolic of the man he'll become. This was a time that North Dakota politics were for the most part Republican and for the most part uh, run uh, from afar by a man named Alexander McKenzie. One of the things that McKenzie did is he has this control over the railroads, uh, insurance companies, banks, and he's able to divvy out the goodies. He's able to divvy out jobs, free railroad transportation, these sorts of things and uh, it's uh, a pretty strong position. He's got power and delivers to the extent that he actually moves his personal residence to St. Paul and runs a dedicated telegraph line from the Merchant's Hotel to the Capitol. So anytime McKenzie wants or needs something, he could have a message sent directly to the uh, state capitol. He delivers the capital. He delivers votes. All of the governors between statehood and John Burke are essentially handpicked by the McKinsey machine. It's your turn. You've paid your dues. Fred Fancher, you've paid your dues. Roger Allen, you've paid your dues. It's your turn to be governor. And basically, you had to be a party loyalist. And many folks uh, who were not part of the McKinsey gang really felt locked out of the Republican Party. You start to see the Republican Party fracturing on McKenzieism, and so you see a unity of individuals who are progressive Republicans and the Democrats joining together in the 1906 election to uh, take out the uh, Republican nominee, uh, who it's actually was running for re-election, Elmore Sorrells at the Democratic nomination process. When it comes time to nominate a governor for the 1906 election, Burke uh, is, is nominated. People start referring to him as Honest John, Honest John Burke. And part of it, I think, was his willingness to take on some of the um, undesirables in state politics, that he wasn't willing to be swayed uh, by apparently some nice offers to uh, go away. John Burke wins the election, not easily. This is considered to be quite the surprise to McKenzie. Supposedly he gets into a fist fight in Bismarck, um, that how could he have possibly lost the, uh, the governor's office, even though he himself wasn't running, but how could he possibly have not been able to control it? Burke shows that you don't have to be a party loyalist, in fact, He's the anti-party loyalist. And uh, after that, I can't swear that every uh, succeeding governor was upright, upstanding, and uh, morally uh, acceptable. But uh, I think the governorship does elevate. It's a different John Burke that takes office in January of 07 than left politics uh, in uh, the, uh, uh, about 1905, 1906. Uh, he's, he's just a different, uh, something has changed in his political mindset. I don't know if you could take one point out of uh, the Burke administration, but I think there's two or three that make it a turning point and uh, what it puts away and what it opens up. We see pure food, pure health, pure seed. Railroads are taxed more highly than they had been, making a contribution uh, to the larger society. We see the creation of a traveling public library. I've always thought of him as the real voice of progressivism in North Dakota. 
we see, I guess it'd be a kinder, friendlier uh, government, one that looks at its own people to what it can do to make things a little bit better for uh, folks. I was in Washington, D.C. summer before last, and you've got all of these guys lined up. You've got, you know, Washington and Jefferson and uh, Robert Livingston almost in a toga. Everyone's looking pretty fine and fancy. And then there's John Burke. If you look at all those other statues, you go, hmm, that's North Dakota. <laughs> Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded in part by the North Dakota Humanities Council and by the members of Prairie Public.